All right, thank you for being here tonight. This is my official welcome. My name is Daniel Gluck, and I serve on, in the School of Leadership and Theology here at William Jessup University. It's our honor to have you with us tonight, many from, I think, Brad's church and from William Jessup and maybe from some other circles around the community. Is anybody here for homecoming by chance, in for homecoming weekend? We have a bunch of people coming in tomorrow. I guess not. Okay. Um, welcome to our evening. It's going to be a lot of fun. Um, let me just give a few quick uh, details. I'm the business guy tonight, so I'm going to give us a few little business details. If you are a William Jessup student, listen to me for just a second. Uh, you can sign in for chapel credit in the back. Some of you can sign in for extra credit uh, offerings in your classes, so please make sure and see the table. I think it's straight back there. Um, and sign in and make sure you get credit. And then this one is even more important. If you are a William Jessup student and you took the pre-survey regarding violence as entertainment, uh, you know who I'm talking to right now, we need you to sign a consent form tonight because we're also gonna send out via email a post-survey and collect some really cool research that you get to be a part of and Brad's going to work through and uh, show us all kinds of cool stuff. So we're going to pass these little clipboards around. There is some fine print. My mom always told me to read the fine print. Um, if you want to take the time to read the fine print, please feel free to do so. We're not trying to trick you. We just want you to sign this form that basically says, I'm participating in a survey. I don't have to participate in the survey. The data is going to be kept in a private database. Uh, we don't think any harm is going to come to the participants of the survey via medication testing or anything like that. It's all going to be clean. Brad's a good guy. Um, but we need your consent. So will you please make sure and sign this if you're a part of our survey tonight. We would love to have you get that going. I'm going to pass one for this side. And if you'll just help us pass it around the rows, that would be outstanding. Okay, we're done with business. That wasn't too painful, was it? It is now my great privilege to uh, introduce to you my colleague in the School of Leadership and Theology. He serves as one of our adjunct professors here at William Jessup University. We love him. Our students love him. He's a great thinker. He's a good friend of mine personally, a man that I trust and respect deeply. Um, and I'm excited to see what God's doing in his life. He is also the founding pastor of Horizon Community Church in Roseville, California. It was started in 1999. Uh, he's the former president of a group called The Common Good, a nonprofit that served emancipating foster youth. And he has some uh, great degrees from Wheaton College and Talbot Theological Seminary and is currently working under Dr. J.P. Moreland. Some of you know, great philosopher from Talbot Seminary on his uh, demon, his doctor of ministry, and this is a part of his research, so we get to benefit from that tonight. Will you join me in giving a rousing William Jessup University welcome to Mr. Brad Swope? Thank you, I appreciate it. We'll see if our levels are right in my home. Am I good? Can you hear me in the back? I was, uh, you know, a little nervous, a little pre-game jitters, uh, but then when I walked in, something really comforted me, and that is, uh, there's, it's leaking from the ceiling, and we're passing clipboards, which makes me feel just like I'm at my church right now, so it's, it's wonderful. Uh, would you join me with prayer, uh, for prayer for just a second? The Benedictines have a practice called statio. It is a practice of pausing and recognizing what you've just come from so that you can be present to what you're just going into. So it's a being quiet, being thankful for what God's done in your life in this day, and then preparing your heart for what God wants to do. Would you do that with me? Thank you, Lord, for your goodness. We're overwhelmed when we see it for what it is. Visit us now. Root us deeply in your truth and in your love. Bring us closer to Jesus as a result of this seminar. And we thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. 
I'm going to get right into it. Um, I'm going to have three assumptions about those of you who are gathered here tonight. I know it's a little dangerous to have assumptions, but we got to start somewhere. So three assumptions. My first assumption is that most of us here are operating from a Christian worldview. We use this definition in my philosophy class. It's a James Sire definition. I'm not going to read the whole thing. You can get familiar with it because it'll be up there for just a second. But a worldview functions as a kind of lens or interpretive grid that all human beings use to kind of interpret reality, to make sense of the world. It's shaped by culture and family and gender and circumstances and experience. A Christian worldview, if I say that we all have a Christian worldview here, it doesn't mean we all think alike. It uh, just means that our faith is a beginning point for us, um, for how we want to live our lives. It serves as a foundation for our choices, and it holds for us a vision of a flourishing life. My second assumption is that uh, I, I think I would imagine that all of us here want to be good. Uh, in their heart of hearts, most people want to be good. They want to do good. They want to be thought of as good. They would like the world to be better because they lived in it. So I assume that you care about people. I assume you care about virtue, that character matters for you, that you believe choices that you make about how to live in the world carry real weight. The third assumption is that I believe many of us here would like to think of ourselves as disciples of Jesus Christ. The simplest way for us to understand discipleship is to think of ourselves as Jesus' students. We've apprenticed ourselves to him in order to live, um, learn from him how to live our lives as if he were us, uh, to reflect the way he lived his life. We know, of course, when we hear the phrase to be made in the image of Christ, that's not spiritual hyperbole. Uh, it means we're to be refashioned by the Spirit so that our lives resemble Jesus's. For most of us, I would say, for most of us, goodness is summed up and defined and modeled by Jesus. And so my hope here tonight is that Jesus will lead us into the good and the true and the beautiful. Now let me reveal a little bit about me as we begin. I want you to understand that I'm not an activist, nor am I a book burner. What do I mean by that? Well, uh, when it comes to violence as entertainment, I come as a fellow struggler. Um, I am by nature aggressive and highly competitive. I led my high school basketball team in technical fouls. I got suspended in high school um, for fighting. I played college football because I loved the violence of it. It still happens to me when I walk somewhere, like the mall. I can still, when someone's coming in this direction, I, I sometimes see myself as planting my face into their chest and driving them into the ground. So violence does not offend me. Um, I also, however, am a student of Jesus and a lover of the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, I believe it's his magnum opus. This teaching, if you take it seriously, confronts us with an ethical framework that seems almost unworkable in this world. Things like loving enemies and not judging and not lusting. So untenable are these ideas that many work very hard to explain why Jesus really doesn't uh, expect us to live that way or mean what he says. Yet I'm convinced that he calls us to live in these ways because it creates circumstances for us and those around us to flourish in this world. Perhaps this teaching more than any other leads me to the seminar today. I try to take seriously Jesus' teaching and I call those who I'm an influence over to take it seriously as well. What about this not a book burner description? Well, <clears throat> I don't believe that rules change the human heart. Uh, I believe that rules restrict ne negative behavior, but they do not inspire positive action. Jesus knew this, and so he never started with rules. He started with the human heart. He worked to transform the human heart so it, that it would lean towards, it would want the good, it would desire the beautiful. Thus, if you expect me to lead a ban against certain items of culture, you're going to be disappointed. We're not going to have a big bonfire after this with copies of Call of Duty and Pulp Fiction. Everybody brings it. We sing Kumbaya and have a big fire. We're not going to do that tonight. I'm simply going to call for us to examine our consumption of violence as a form of entertainment to see what power it has on us and to see if it conforms to the ways that Jesus calls us to live. So I, I really do want you to own your own life. Um, I want you to own your life fully as a disciple of Jesus, even to the extent that it 
it influences what you allow yourself to be entertained by. Which leads us to my prayer for tonight. This is Philippians 1, 9 through 11. This is Paul writing to the church of Philippi. He says, and this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless until the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Think about that for a second. Love, informed by knowledge and depth of insight, which leads to discernment as to what is best, which turns into a life that is filled with the fruit of righteousness, which ultimately gives praise and glory to God. Who's in? That's our goal. Okay, so why are we here tonight? <clears throat> Look at these images with me and ask yourself what these images have in common. They are all violent and they're all projected for your entertainment. The seminar is the final um, project for my doctorate at Talbot. And I want to kind of give you a, 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 an understanding as how I got here. I was standing uh, at a coffee shop about two years ago, listening, um, you know, I wasn't even listening or eavesdropping, but uh, two baristas were talking very excitedly about uh, what had happened just that last weekend. And as I tuned in, they were talking about the fact that you just both been to an MMA fight. Um, an MMA fight, uh, it's, a, it's a UFC, um, it's an octagon. How many of you have ever seen an MMA fight or seen on television? Okay. It, it's, a, it's a relatively new sport where people from a range of martial arts uh, compete. They try to knock each other out or get somebody to submit by tapping out. And as these guys talked about this event, they talked about, with some excitement, the blows dealt and the blood spilt and the visceral reaction of the crowd. And what caused me to notice the conversation was that these two guys, I was pretty sure, were interns at a local church. Um, at the same time, I was reading primary sources in the first, second, and third century as to the church's response to the gladiatorial contest. Um, these early Christians refused to attend these contests and became the primary moral force to shut down the games. Eventually, they became illegal. And so the, the juxtaposition struck me as really ironic. Um, here were Christians celebrating and enjoying the gladiatorial combat, and there were Christians who stood in opposition. Now, uh, don't mistake, uh, MMA fights are not the same thing as the Colosseum. But I believe they both appeal to the same part of our humanity. Uh, we're drawn to violence. We're fascinated by it. We're quite happy to voyeuristically consume it. I mean, you don't have to teach school kids to gather around combatants and yell, fight, fight, fight. I mean, nobody teaches that, but any campus, that's exactly what's going to happen. So it's already in us somehow. Yet just as clearly, here the Christian community in the first, second, third century opted out of normal, cultural, recreational consumption of violence as entertainment. Even more ironic to me was the fact that some churches, as I studied this, were actually using MMA as a way to draw men into their outreaches. They would actually pay for the fights. And so men would invite men to come in and watch the fight, and this would be a way of extending their men's ministry. So as I began to see the violent content of this sport, I also began to observe how violence drunk we are as a culture. So much of our entertainment seems to be centered on violence. Three-fourths of all video games uh, have violent, graphic violent content, especially the most popular. When it comes to TVs and movies, two-thirds uh, contain significant violence. Uh, movies such as Deadpool and Suicide Squad, The Purge, TV shows. Um, it's just everywhere. Get this, 12% of real life crime is violent. On television, 90%. By the time a child is 18, they're going to see 200,000 violent acts and 18,000 murders on television. And the violent content only seems to be increasing. Well, you say, well, that's just culture. That doesn't mean Christians are consuming it. Here's what's interesting. Dick Staub, author of Culturally Savvy Christian, tells us that statistically, evangelicals, you and I, our tribe, we consume more than the rest of the, uh, the population. It's our tribe that loves it. In fact, quoting Ted Berry, he says, extensive research indicates that most Christians have the same media diet as non-Christians. 
The same percentage of Christian teenagers as non-Christian watch R-rated movies with the same frequency. <coughs> and my experience is that culturally, Christians are indistinguishable from the culture. We seem to be right there with us. In fact, <coughs> the, st the, the survey you guys filled out shows basically the same thing. 80% of you say you watch between 2 and 10 hours of violent content every month, movies and television. Um, and you watch it. This is really interesting. This is the other thing the survey showed. You and I watch it, even though we believe it makes the world more violent. We watch it, even though 65% felt like it, it makes us feel less safe in the world. We watch it, even though we, we believe that it negatively affects even adults. And we watch it, 58% of us, uh, but watch it even though we think that it makes us less empathetic to real life violence. As a 50 year old man who was raised in the church and educated at Wheaton and Talbot, as I thought about this problem, I could not think of one time, not one time I was asked as a Christian to think about my consumption of violence as entertainment. In fact, again, you guys agree with me. 71% uh, said you've never been challenged to even think about this, not here at Jessup and not in your churches. Uh, in the survey, I won't mention this, but I asked the opposite question. How about graphic sexual content? The reverse was true, right? 75% said, yes, the church has been helpful. But yet the church has not been helpful to you on this subject. As I began to ask why we as Christians choose to be entertained by violence in ways that make us indistinguishable, I found that most people were not interested. In fact, what was most interesting to me is that when I tried to engage men on this subject, I found myself being dismissed as passive, weak, less of a man just by asking the question. Think about it for just a second. How co-opted do we have to be by the culture so that I can't even ask the question, is this good or not? I mean, largely, uh, the game's over. We, we've accepted it. We've swallowed the whole thing. And of course, that made me mad that I was dismissed. So I thought, okay, that's my research topic right there. There's, I told you about being aggressive and hostile. And, right, there it is. <laughs> I'll show you, right? I'm gonna, you can dismiss me all you want. So I decided this was the subject I'd research. And so tonight, here are the questions we're going to try to answer. Oh, I think I skipped one. All right. Uh, why are we so attracted to violence as human beings? What impact does it have on us, especially with digital media, video games, and sport? And does our faith have anything to say about whether we should consume it or not? I'm going to give us some very quick definitions. What is violence? The World Health Organization says the intentional use of physical force or power threatened or actual against oneself, another person, or against a group or community. It either results in or has a high likelihood of resulting in injury, death, psychological harm, maldevelopment, or deprivation. Entertainment, pretty simple. Uh, something affording pleasure, diversion, amusement, especially performance of some kind. Entertainment may seem passive to us, <clears throat> but we're gonna learn tonight that when we are uh, entertained, we are not passive observers, it shapes us. As we consume it, we participate, we engage, we're shaped by it. And so what is violence as entertainment? This is my definition. When de depictions or demonstrations of physical, emotional, or psychological violence, whether real or fictional, are used as a form of relaxation, diversion, amusement, or pleasure by an observer. To be clear, we're investigating uh, the impact of violence as entertainment. We all know that real life violence um, is almost always negative and almost always scarring deeply. Think about your own experience of real life violence. It changed you, didn't it? I was beat up in, uh, by two boys in the seventh grade in the boys' bathroom. I moved to, uh, that next week to a new city. I had dreams for years about going back and finding them and beating the tar out of them. It scarred me, it, it changed the way I thought about myself in the world. So our experience of violence is almost always negative. So then why is it that we want to be entertained by it? It's a really interesting question. So that is our question for tonight. Uh, hopefully there will be lots of interesting information for you but that you'll be engaged as well. We're going to talk about TV and movies first, video games second. How many gamers do we have in here? Let's, let's be honest. Okay. You guys have to wait for the second one. And then MMA uh, goes third. How many MMA? Okay, there we go. So just stick with me and we will uh, get, to get to all three of them. Let's first talk about digital uh, violence and digital media. How much do we like it? Well, you and I consume a lot of visual media. 2015. 
1.7 trillion hours. The average person in America consumes 10 and a half hours per person per day. That includes TV, movies, radio, computer, and phone. We spent $11 billion going to the movies and $12.8 million on digital media. Here were your, uh, I don't know if you can even see those. These are the blockbusters from 2016. Eight out of 10, graphic violence, Deadpool, Suicide Squad. You guys wonder, why is Zootopia up there? What do you recall from Zootopia? Do you remember kidnapping? Yeah. Mob hits? Even in our cartoons, it's amazing how the violence sneaks in there. Um, researchers at Ohio State concluded the violent content in films has more than doubled since 1950. <clears throat> Gun violence in PG-13 rated films more than tripled since 1985. Now I'm going to show you a clip from uh, the final fight scene from Jason Bourne. I hope you can see it. It's a little bit dark. But I want you to try to count how many severe blows to the head and body are dealt in this one. Okay, it's a minute and 19 seconds. All right, so I want to see if your number corresponds to my number or not. So uh, let's, let's see if I can get this going. We will have a commercial at some point. Okay, how much you get? 40. I had 40. I had exactly. You win a prize. I didn't bring any prize for you tonight, but you won a prize. Uh, was that a violent level uh, unusual for you or normal? That was, that was just normal, right? Anybody ever been in a fight here before? Anybody ever take a shot in the face like that before? How many of those do you think you can take? One. Maybe one. <laughs> you don't get up after, uh, after more than one of those. Uh, it's amazing to me, the, the level of violence, and we just saw it, and it's just normal to us. It, has no, it doesn't bear any resemblance to real life at all. Um, here's your top uh, television shows. Again, 8 out of 10, significant violence. Researchers tell us between 98 and 206, 2006, TV violence increased in every time sh slot. The 8 o'clock hour, 45%. The 9 o'clock hour, 92%, and the 10 o'clock hour, 167% uh, more violence on our television. So the first question we have to ask is, we know that we like it. Why do we like it? Why do we like it so much? Uh, in his book, Lust for Blood, Why We're Fascinated by Death, Murder, Horror, and Violence, Je Dr. Jeffrey Kotler describes some of the reasons. I'm going to give you some quickly here because I have to watch my time. Violence is stimulating because our bodies and brains are hardwired to enjoy it and respond to it. We once needed violence in order to survive, but now uh, experience of violence is more rare for us in the Western world. So with few opportunities in contemporary life to exercise the tools of violent aggression that were once necessary for survival, the best were offered are ritualized arenas were encouraged to experience the thrill of participation by watching at a safe distance. Second, he says, <clears throat> we use violent media to explore violence without experiencing it ourselves. Quote, the screen, the game, the sport puts violence at a safe distance. We experience it only voyeuristically. Our own experience of violence are not the same. That means that we can take it in doses and we can always turn it off. 
Third, he says, it feeds our need for vicarious thrill, emotional catharsis, and hunger for novelty. The civilizing process uh, has muted many of the forms of emotional expression over the millennia, aggression and violence most of all. Violent media gives expression to these forms. Two more. Violence uh, in the media also gives us a chance to explore the forbidden. This is um, Brad Bushman, professor at Ohio State. The attraction of violence could be that it gives people a chance to experience taboo, events they can't experience in their own lives or see things they don't see in their typical life. I think this might be especially true of Christians. I think when you live in a moralistic kind of environment, uh, this may be a, a way for us to kind of explore something that's taboo. This is the only, I knew so many Christians that watched Orange is the New Black. I think this might fit this. A way of exploring the taboo, a world we know nothing about, and be entertained by it. Finally, he says that violence is ritualized, institutionalized, and rewarded in our dominant cultural narrative. If you think about our bedtime tales, uh, our, our founding myths, even our biblical narratives, they're filled with violent conquest. And so he says humans are raised on tales of violence and so need violence reintroduced in their stories. So these are some of the reasons why violence as entertainment is appealing to us, but to what end? I'm going to try to have to move this quickly, but... <coughs> uh, this has been debated and tested for decades. I've sifted through for months through the research. I'm gonna give you my conclusions. What's clear is that there's clearly a negative impact on children. If, if you as parents or if your parents took this seriously, they did the right thing. So here are some quotes up there. I'm gonna read them quickly. In 2009, policy statement on media violence, the American Academy of Pediatrics said extensive research evidence indicates that media violence can contribute to aggressive behavior, desensitization to violence, nightmares, and fear of being harmed. The second quote, hundreds of studies of the effects of TV violence on children and teenagers have found that children may become, listen to this, immune or numb to the horror of violence, begin to accept violence as a way to solve problems, imitate the violence they observe on television, and identify with certain characters, victims, and or victimizers. They also say often aggressive habits are learned early in life, and they form the foundation for later antisocial behavior. One report said they can attribute approximately 10% in later criminal behavior to watching early violence when you're a child. That's remarkable if you think about it. It's also clear from our study that there's a negative impact in the short term on adults. That's why I've invited you here, right? You're adults now, you're thinking, well, I can watch this stuff now. Well, here's some of the things that we know. Violent media can trigger trait hostility and aggression in the short term. Studies show that watching violent content can increase feelings of hostility and accessibility of aggressive thoughts. Uh, exposure to violent media impacts the part of the brain that controls emotion and brain. It actually has something to do, I'm not even giving you the quote, semi. Uh, something to do, it suppresses pro-social behavior and releases and forms the brain around anti-social behavior. <clears throat> so two independents show that uh, exposure to video games and movie violence causes participants to downplay real-life violence and to be slower to help those in need. They set up an experiment where outside of a movie theater, they had some, a woman cry for help. The people who watch the violent movies were less likely to respond and responded less quickly than the people who came out of the other movies. That's really interesting, isn't it? So there's a deadening, in the short term, there's a deadening to awareness of other people's pain just in the short term. But then of course that leads to the next question. What about long term? Is there long term consequences on adults? Violent media, we, this has been tested ex uh, extensively. There doesn't seem to be a, um, a direct correlation between violent media and the crime rate. So uh, measuring crime rate is the ver in the very short term. No direct causal link between watching violence and crime in the immediate aftermath can be made. So th there's no direct link there. But um, there does seem to be a rise in the fear of crime. So, quote, the more time people spend living in the television world, the more likely they are to believe social reality portrayed on television. So if you're absorbing almost all the violence, you begin to think the world is less safe. I do this every year in my classes. I ask, do you believe the world is safe or not, right? And um, 
the, the, just as the first class. And invariably, most people say they think the world's not safe. And I say, do you realize you live in one of the safest places on the planet? Rockland, California, you can hardly get any safer than that. Yet you fear, right? You, can, you, you feel afraid. Um, part of it is because we're exposed to so much of this media violence. And so here's some conclusions. Watching violent media, we can, it can cause trait hostility and aggression in the short term. It seems to decrease our capacity for empathy. It seems to desensitize us to the impact of real life violence. It increases our perception uh, that the world is unsafe. And for these reasons, I would argue that the whole American culture should take this seriously. But as I said, I'm speaking in some ways to the church tonight, the disciples of Jesus. And so I want to ask a further question. Do we have a reason to think through this in different ways? Um, how are we supposed to approach consumption media violence? So in his book, You Are What You Love, philosopher James K.A. Smith asserts that human beings at our core love, live not from our rational minds, but from our hearts. I'm going to take us somewhere. We're going to take a minute to get there. He says that it's our passions and affections, what we love, that directs our lives, not our logic and reason. And he also talks about the power of narrative or story to shape our imaginations for what we love. So narrative shapes our hearts, our loves. It orients us, right? Um, he says that there are contending narratives, he calls them liturgies, that compete to form and shape what we love. So uh, now think about a football game, going to the mall, and a church service. Smith would say they're all liturgical, and they're all telling you uh, a couple of things. They're influencing you and trying to tell you what is good, what is valuable, and what you should pursue with your life. Each seeks to form what you love. So his challenge in this book is to always be aware of the stories and narratives and liturgies that seek to win our affection and to consciously choose which story we want to shape our lives. All right, so keep that in mind. The power of narrative, all right? Now I want to introduce you to Walter Wink. He's another theologian. This is his book, Engaging the Powers. Wink talks about the imaginative power of one particularly modern cultural narrative that's actually a very ancient story. He calls that story one that seeks to find meaning in the violence of this world, the myth of redemptive violence. Keep that phrase in your mind, the myth of redemptive violence. Within this myth, one is taught that violence is not just necessary to live in the world, but it's also useful and can be used to solve problems. So he says, violence appears to be the nature of things. It's what works. It seems inevitable, the last and often the fir uh, first resorts in conflicts. Further, Wink says, the myth perpetuates the claim that violence can actually be used for good, that it can bring peace, and that it can be something that heals, that, that it is redemptive. He says, the myth of redemptive violence enshrines the belief that violence saves, that war brings peace, that Mike's, might makes right. And so he claims that this myth is at the foundation of most of our entertainment and our stories. So just think about this with me. I'm going to throw up some movies here. The Karate Kid. My generation, not your generation. Here in this movie, violence gives a boy identity, confidence, and strength. Jack Reacher. He uses violence to overcome injustice. Suicide Squad. How many have seen this movie, Suicide Squad? One of the worst movies I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> What's really interesting about this movie, did you notice at the end, it was violence, doing violence together that brought these misfits and gave them what? A family. It was heal, right? That's the whole point of the movie is these misfits come together and they form a Suicide Squad, a family. It's redemptive. Violence heals. Every DC superhero, right? Violence helps us restore order. How about a movie like 300? Violence gives you honor in 300. And here's the sneaky one. How many of you have seen The Help? What's this a picture of? So how about this? This is a theory. Retribution in the form of a pie with human excrement in it lets the oppressed rise up and put the oppressor in her place. I mean, could you do more violence to a person than, than giving them human poop pie? I mean, it's... 
In these stories, as long as the other side is painted as bad or evil, all kinds of violence is shown to be justified, necessary, appropriate, redemptive, and even funny. You guys remember the Indiana Jones where he's in a courtyard um, and the guy's doing the sword play and he just takes out his gun and shoots the guy? What was the reaction? Everybody laughed. Think about that for a second. It's even funny. Wing contends that this myth is found everywhere and because we largely accept and believe it, you and I prepare to live from this myth in our own lives. Oh, we may not be prepared to use physical violence, but we're prepared to use the threat of violence to get what we want. Just work with me on this one. Picture the mild-mannered customer standing peacefully at the return counter. Then watch as they're told that they cannot return an item. Watch the voice, watch the face, watch the hands, the tone, the facial expression begins to communicate the threat of violence. You ever heard of the expression, they were shooting daggers at me? You realize your face, when you get angry, it communicates to the other, you're in danger. I'm about to explode on you. I'm not responsible for what's about to happen, right? Um, when we display anger, that's what we communicate. And so the customer vents on the hapless employee until they go get the manager. Now watch the same customer when the manager comes and gives the customer what they want. They soften. The tension leaves. Often they begin to explain why they were right or why they needed to do this. They sometimes even apologize. But what just happened? They justified the use of the threat of violence to get what they wanted. They use violence to restore order and get the right result. Richard Hayes says this, the knee-jerk impulse that has affected humanity since Cain, the impulse to impose our will through violence. And because we buy into the myth of redemptive violence, it serves as a foundation for behavior and it's reinforced every time it works for us. Wink compares the myth of redemptive violence with an alternative redemptive narrative, one that centers on peace, not violence. In this narrative, a man named Jesus of Nazareth abandons the myth of redemptive violence as utterly useless in trying to solve, fix, heal, or save the world. If anybody understood the depth of evil and how important it was to eradicate it, it had to be Jesus. And if anybody understood how important it was to reestablish truth and justice and righteousness, it had to be Jesus. So how would he do it? Jesus, we're told, had access to the weapons of this world in order to combat evil. He had access to angel armies, earthly followers, a keen intellect, a magnetic personality. He could have swelled those forces together to form his kingdom, but he chose not to. Instead, he redeems, heals, saves, not through violence, but through nonviolence, not with overwhelming physical force, but by sacrifice, not by might, by suffering on the cross. So it's Jesus' method, only Jesus' method, that truly heals, redeems, and saves. He brings peace. He demonstrates the efficacy of his model and his method and the way he lived. He calls his followers to do the same. And it was the spirit-filled church taking up in the first four centuries the Sermon on the Mount that changed the world and showed the pagan Roman culture with its ritualized violence to be bankrupt. Here's my point. If you and I are saved through the redemptive power of the way of Jesus, and if we call ourselves his disciples, why is it that we still turn to the old myth of redemptive violence to entertain ourselves? And if violence is not part of our future, why do we continue to lean on it now? It seems that we as Christians need to decide which door we have more confidence in and which we put more stock in. We need to intentionally decide which story will shape our imagination, which will shape what we love, which will teach us how to live. Are we as his apprentices prepared to live a life that abandons the myth of redemptive violence or not? Are we ready to learn from him what it means to turn the other cheek and forgive as we've been forgiven and to love the enemy? If so, it may be time to challenge what we allow ourselves to be fascinated by, fantasize about, and entertained by. Our challenge as Christians is to begin to see and critique the stories we're told in digital media. I'm not asking in any way for a ban on any show on, with violence in it. There are plenty of stories that have redemptive stories where violence is overcome or revealed as destructive, but I do want us to start asking these kinds of questions. What attracts me to this movie and TV show? What does it feed in me? 
How does it affect me? What is it influencing me to love and believe and accept? Should I love, believe, and accept what it wants me to? My suspicion, if we do this simple thing, we may start to lose our taste for stories that are counter to the gospel. I think that's my only prayer. Maybe we just start losing our taste for it a little bit. And my hope is that as we take seriously the method and teaching of Jesus, we may in fact begin to have a shaping influence on our culture. Okay. We have a lot still to do. Let's go to video games. There it is, Grand Theft Auto V. How much do we like video games? Well, we're playing, and we're playing a lot. I'm not even sure you guys can see. Yeah, you can see it. A billion people play on average an hour a day. Does that surprise you? There's only 7 billion people in the world. 53% of American adults play uh, over 18 play video games. 21 play basically every day. 99% of boys under 18, 92% of girls play regularly. Boys average, get this, 13 hours a week. Girls, 8 hours. Before they turn 21, young adults will spend 10,000 hours. Why is that mark interesting? Malcolm Gladwell says it makes you a master at something, right? 10,000 hours of doing anything. We're buying. In 2016, the world spent 99 billion. Americans spent 24 billion. In 2016, seven of the top 10 were first-person shooters. In 2013, Grand, uh, <clears throat> Grand Theft Auto V. Does anybody want to guess how much money it made in the first 24 hours? Go ahead and shout out a number. $800 million. It made a billion dollars in three days. We love this game. Um, each new release seems to improve on the graphic, visceral quality of violent depictions. So we want to ask, why do we like it? Um, Iowa State University, Douglas Gentile, who studies the effects of violent video games on children, says violent games tap into a primal instinct. There are two things that force us to pay attention, he says. One is violence, the other is sex. They both have for us survival value. He explains violent video games are more appealing than nonviolent ones in that the same chemicals are released in the brain that you would have in violent conflict if you play the violent video game. This is pretty interesting. He says that the violent video games, um, he says these gamers have adrenaline rush, it's noradrenaline, it's testosterone, it's cortisol. These are the so-called stress hormones. It's exactly the same cocktail of hormones you drop into your bloodstream if I punched you. He says that video games tap into the ABCs of human motivation. A is for autonomy. You're holding a controller, so you're in control. We like to be in control. B, it's for belonging. If you're doing it with friends, um, there's a social fabric that's being built. It's meeting your belonging needs. C is for competence. We like to be good at things, and video games train you to get better. And so we feel better about ourselves as we play these video games. Kevin Scott, in his book of Games and Gods, tells us that we're drawn to video games because they require active participation in ways that movies do not. He, calls, he says that video games are actually meaning makers. When you play, you make meaning for yourself. This is very attractive. He also says in video games, you get to so uh, problem solve, and you get to actually play with ethical uh, questions. He says, actually, this is pretty, it's a healthy thing. It's, it's a positive thing. Jane McGonigal, in her book, Super Better, says that video games offer us blissful productivity, social fabric, urgent optimism, and epic meaning. They also offer an escape from those parts of our lives that are unsatisfying and that we want to escape from. So, um, why, uh, what effect do these video games have, especially violent ones? Well, we're finding that there's some good and some bad. She's, uh, McGonagall lists some of the positive outcomes of gaming in general that can be applied to these games. There is creativity, it improves determination, uh, real life cooperation, skills, build relationship. In fact, what they've, what they've now found out is that uh, when we talk about the negative outcomes of violent video games, if you play with your friend, they all get wiped out. That's really interesting. So there's something really positive about friendship that overwhelms whatever negative aggression it, it rises up in you. Um, I actually observed this. I told you I'm a fellow struggler. My son, uh, my six-year-old son, uh, has, has Call of Duty in our house, all right? And this, this preparation for this, I watched. I watched him play. I watched him play by himself, and I watched him play with his buddies. Two completely experiences. 
Uh, when he's with his buddies, they're laughing. They're, they're, they're working together. Um, it, it's just, it was just an obvious, a different experience from in both those contexts. Video games also have been used to treat clino, clinic, uh, clinical anxiety, depression, stress, and PTSD. It's interesting, McGonagall herself had a brain injury, and games helped her actually kind of overcome that brain injury. But science also asserts that there's some negative influences uh, that are tied to playing violent video games. Studies show short-term causal link between video games, violent video games, and a rise in trait hostility and aggression. Here's time it says, in a report published 2013, the APA task force reviewed more than 100 studies. Um, they concluded that playing video games can increase aggressive behavior and thoughts while lessening empathy and sensitivity towards aggression. Um, I put those other quotes up there. Um, the link between vi uh, violent video game exposure and aggressive behavior is one that is most studied and best established. Uh, the second quote, they find that violent video game is used is associated with decreases in socially desirable behavior such as pro-social behavior, empathy, and moral engagement. They actually start doing brain scans to see what's happening in gamers. Uh, it, it works with the part of the brain uh, where these decisions, these behaviors are formed. So let me see what quotes I have here. Our results indicate that virtual violence in video games play uh, results in those neural patterns that are considered characteristic for aggressive cognition and behavior. It also has a suppression mechanism. Look at that last quote. Scientific studies have shown that defeating someone you don't know, this is one of the worst, when, when you, it brings out the very worst. If you play somebody you don't know in a game, it brings out the very worst hostility and aggression. And in fact, you can, you can observe this very easily. If you play a stranger, it's the, it's the same role in, in nature as wanting to dominate somebody. So it's the role of dominance. Uh, uh, it's a surge of testosterone. Okay, um, let me skip ahead. Studies also show a link between chronic play of vi violent video games and increased desensitization to real life violence. Where's that quote? Media violence initially produces fear, disgust, and other avoidance related motivational states. Repeated exposure to media violence, however, reduces psychological impact and eventually produces aggressive approach related motivational states. Um, what's even more interesting, and this is probably the one that caught my attention the most, was that entering the fantasy world in games where you get to act in morally ambiguous ways can alter real life moral decisions. So they did a test with gamers to test right after gameplay. Um, they gave the, the ability to cheat on a test or to uh, like eat as much uh, a candy as you wanted to. So the people that played violent video games, guess what? They had less self-control and they cheated more than the people that just played regular video games. So there's a corollary between the, the decisions you make in the game and the, the short-term choices you make immediately following. So the quote is, the present research establishes a causal link between exposure to violent video games and real immoral behaviors. In particular, this is the first study to show that playing violent video games can increase cheating and decrease self-control. And to be clear, uh, if you're not familiar with these games, um, there's, some, there's some really morally depraved games. The top game is Grand uh, Theft Auto. So in the top, what you, f what you see there, I actually had a video clip of this. You can find this on YouTube. So you can go get a prostitute have sex in the car with her, give her your money, let her get out of the car, you get out of the car, you choose the weapon of your choice, you kill her, you get your money back, you get more points. Manhunter 2, the game below, you have to carry out executions and you're rewarded. The more brutal, the more points you get. So we wonder about the effect of such games on us as we play them. But the obvious question is, do short-term effects translate into negative behaviors in the long term. So every time there's a serial shooting, right, you watch any sh news show, and what's, gonna, what's the question? You know, what's the role of violent video games? Here's what we now know. <clears throat> a healthy, normal, nonviolent child or adolescent who has no other risk factors for high aggression or violence is not going to become a school shooter simply because they play five or ten hours a week in these games. Extreme forms of violence always occur, almost always occur when there's a convergence of multiple risk factors. This is a point my son didn't even have to read the study and he tells me this all the time. I'm not going to become a shooter, dad, right? Um, the idea is it, it doesn't translate one to one. However, the elements they're talking about are these. Abuse of home life, isolation, being bullied, being marginalized, depression, exposure to real life violence, and or mental illness. If you add vi video games to that cocktail, you can have results that look very much like Columbine and Sandy Hook. 
And you think about the number of homes where those things are normal. In other words, these, when these markers are present, video games can be a trigger to antisocial behavior. Additionally, it's also clear that these games do simulate real life skill. It's something called operant conditioning. Um, it's a procedure of stimulus response training which gives people the skill to act under stressful conditions automatically without thinking. So if you think about it this way, you think about a pilot being trained in a flight simulator. He's not actually facing danger, right? Um, he's, he's in a simulator, but it stimulates the same sorts of things such that he can learn the skill of how to operate if those, uh, those conditions ever present themselves, right? So now he's in the plane and he automatically reacts without thinking to the same circumstances in real life. Well, um, these games essentially work the same way, the violent first-person shooters. We know this because both the military and the police use slightly modified versions of games that are found in family consoles everywhere to train their police officers. We know it has the ability to train. So um, Dave Grossman in his book, Stop Teaching Our Kids to Kill, gives this example. In 1997, 14-year-old Michael Carniel stole a neighbor's gun and went to school in Paducah, Kentucky, where he shot eight students in a prayer meeting before school. Three of the eight died, and one was paralyzed. Now, he had never shot a gun before. He had shot them about seven yards away. He opened a door, shot them. They say, uh, the FBI says, the average law enforcement would average about a 20% hit, the right target, the right place. He was eight for eight, five headshots, three shots in the upper torso. He had played hundreds of hours of violent video games. Studies have shown that when you take gamers who play violent video games who have never shot a gun and people who have never uh, played violent video games and you teach them to shoot, the marksmanship is way higher in first person shooters. So there is seemingly some conditioning that's happening within these violent games. That said, it's not easy to draw a direct causal relationship from violent video games to violent behavior because only longitudinal studies can do this, and there are not that many. And that, the reason why there's not that many studies is because it's a fairly recent phenomenon. We haven't had violent video games for long enough to study it over decades to really draw long conclusions. But here are some conclusions from three separate uh, longitudinal studies. We found support um, as participants who played violent video games throughout high school also reported steeper increases in aggressive behavior over time. The second study says habitual violent video game play early in the school year predicted later aggression. Um, they were more physically aggressive. And the last quote is, it's true that as a player, you're not just moving your hand on a joystick, but are indeed interacting with the game uh, psychologically and emotionally. So it's not surprising that when the game involves rehearsed uh, aggressive and violent thoughts and actions, such deep game involvement results in antisocial effects on the player. Okay, it's a mixed bag. That's the truth of the matter. The social science says it's a mixed bag. You cannot always know what's going on with the player. You don't know how they approach the game, and you don't know what's affecting them. There's enough there to be concerned as a culture, but I'm going to give us a reason to think about this as a Christian that goes beyond just the science. I want to talk about the role uh, and the power of fantasy for a second. I want to take you to the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus describes in concrete terms what a life centered in the kingdom of God can look like. His method is to take what is the accepted moral standard of the Old Testament law, you have heard it said, and um, then raise the bar so that people see the real issues that are at stake. But I tell you. The reason he does this, again, he's less condi uh, interested in controlling the outward behavior. He wants to form the heart. He wants the heart to know and understand intentionality. And again, the concept of the heart in the Bible means emotions, will, and mind. So he says to his disciples and the crowd that's around them, you've heard that it was said you shall not commit adultery, but I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in her heart. Essentially, he says this, stop patting yourself on the back for not sleeping with a woman who's not your wife. If you're fantasizing the act of sex with her in your heart, you're also violating God's law. He's shining a light here on the power of fantasy within our thought life. He isn't teaching us that sexual fantasy is the same as actual adultery, but he's revealing the danger of lustful fantasy in this way. When we fantasize, we are forming habits or dispositions to act in a certain way given the right kinds of circumstances. Here's how it works. When it comes to lust, we are saying, here's how I would act if I could get away with it. Here's how I'd act if nobody would ever find out. 
So if I'm fantasizing about a woman that's not my wife, I'm saying to my, I'm building the disposition. Here's how I would really like to act if nobody really ever found out. We're building a foundation for the fantasized behavior to occur if the right conditions present themselves. It's kind of a moral operant conditioning. You are preparing yourself for it. And that's why the church has always asserted that it's vitally important to guard what goes into the mind and what is fantasized about in the heart. It's not a one-to-one correspondence from fantasy to real life, but clearly you're forming an orientation, a calibration that is destructive to the human person. So if I were to ask, should we as Christians ever practice in our minds or fantasize about what God is clearly against and what we say we do not believe in? Your answer to me would be no. Should we try it again? The answer would be Then if there were a video game that allowed us to fantasize about sexual acts, even with an avatar, you could play a game and you could just have sex with different people, right? What would you say about that? Well, you say, oh, that's not good because it's malforming my heart against something that God has said I shouldn't do. Okay, if that's true, why then would we fantasize ourselves acting in ways that are counter to the clear teaching of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount when it comes to violence? Why would we visualize wreaking violence, death, destruction on other people in gameplay? Why would we allow those images to captivate us? Dallas Willard says, the ultimate freedom as human beings is the power to select what we allow or require our minds to dwell upon. You ever wonder why meditation on scripture is so vitally important? The process of spiritual formation, he says, is one of progressively replacing those destructive images and ideas with the images and ideas that filled the mind of Jesus himself. So further questions could then be asked. Does our play position us to be more violent in the real world simply as a byproduct of what we've allowed ourselves to fantasize about? Does it dull us to the impact of real life violence? Does it make us less empathetic? Does it reinforce negative stereotypes? Does it make us more prone to use violent means? We wonder why Christians are not more like Christ. Could part of the answer be the images and stories we put before our hearts and minds in our entertainment? Is it possible the things that we allow ourselves to be entertained in so form us that when we go out into the real world, we can't really even be like Christ? Willard contends we have to carefully choose what idea systems we allow to shape us. The needed transformation is very largely a matter of placing in ourselves those idea systems of evil and their corresponding cultures with the idea system that Jesus Christ embodied and taught and with the culture of the kingdom of God. This is truly a passage from darkness to light. Now, I interviewed um, Kevin Scott, the professor at Trinity Western, the author of the book of Games and God. He studies this a lot. I really respect his book. It was a great book. And he said to me, the problem, Brad, is not consumption, but it's unthinking consumption. We need to be more aware of what games communicate to us and how they shape us. And so he posed for us two good questions that I want to leave with you. The first is this. What is my motivation in playing the game? Am I feeling lonely or restless? Am I working out fantasies? Do I feel weak and so need to assert some type of control or dominance? then these games may in fact malform us in destructive ways. So what do I bring to the game? The second question is then how do I, how does the game affect me? It may not lead me to violence, but does does it dull my Christian convictions? Does it diminish my capacity to feel empathy in the real world? Does it trigger an appetite for the wrong sorts of things? Does it feed vice? Alternatively, does it lead me to goodness? Does it bring the best out of me? You knew this verse was going to get in here somewhere, right? Whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Our thoughtful participation, not outright rejection, may lead us to begin to ask the right kinds of questions and lead us to new personal convictions. How are we doing? We're two-thirds through. Can you stand with me for one more? I know you don't have to. Should we stand up for just a second? Stand up, stretch your legs, and then sit right back down. Listen to me drone on. (laughs) Stretch your legs. We got one more segment to go. This may be a good excuse for some people to leave. (laughs) 
Okay, as you're ready, go ahead and find your seats again. As my mentor JP Moreland says, do you still love me? Do you still, I need, I need to know that you still love me, okay? All right. As long as you still love me, that's all that's important. Are you ready to talk about MMA? So, <clears throat> here's what I want us to think about here. I'm not talking, if you are involved with MMA, personally, boxing, football, karate, jiu-jitsu, we're not talking about your participation in those sports. They can be made for a variety of good reasons, health, safety, fitness, uh, competition. I want us to talk about what it means to be a spectator at a violent sport. And I'm gonna be focusing my attention mostly on MMA and UFC when we discuss the ramifications of consuming violence as entertainment in our sports. And that's because UFC is experiencing unprecedented popularity and it's the closest to what we might call blood sport, though of course boxing could be folded in there as well. A careful observer, however, might see that this discussion could easily have application in a gladiatorial sport like football, which has a high incidence of injury, but I'll let you kind of figure that out yourself. How much do we like it? In the year 2000, a struggling business called UFC was sold for $2 million to two brothers. At that point, the controversial sport was relatively new, was even banned in some places, faced an uncertain future. But the sport and the business took off like wildfire over the last two decades. So in 2015, it brought in about $1,600 million in revenue. That's good business. Last July, it was sold as a business for $4 billion. That's a good investment. Uh, UFC content is available on Fox, Fox Sports 1, Fox Sports 2, 156 countries, 22 languages. Here's what's most interesting to me. Uh, in its audience, it claims 45% of its uh, audience is millennials. So it's the young that are watching this. Um, the biggest fighter in the sport right now is Conor McGregor. He fought last November uh, at Madison Square Garden. It was the highest performing fight in history. 1.4 million pay-per-view buys. That's homes, bars, churches that bought the fight for about 60 bucks. That means it grossed about 75 million in pay-per-view. The attendance was 20,427, a domestic record. It smashed MSG's previous best-selling gate, bringing in 17.7 million. So it, was the, it brought in the most money at any event in the history of Madison Square Garden. Think about that for a second. Um, Dana White, the UFC promoter, is confident that this new gate record will stand forever, saying, quote, Jesus is going to have to fight the devil to break the record. The social media impressions from this night were 14 billion. 14 billion is the most ever. For those who have never seen it, I'm going to show you some clips of um, Conor McGregor's fights. Welcome to the water bar. We have tap waters from all across the country. This water mm -hmm. contains an exception. So dangerous. 
That's the sport. Um, clearly, we like it. Clearly, uh, it's captured our imagination. Here's what's most interesting to me. ESPN reports that 5.5 million teens, 3.2 million children younger than 13, are currently participating in MMA. That's as much as youth tackle football and Little League Baseball. So we're building it into our culture. We're building an imagination for it in the culture. Why do we love it? <coughs> All right. It taps into our most primal instincts. Craig Kennedy, professor at Vanderbilt, says, aggression occurs among virtually all vertebrates and is necessary to get and keep important resources such as mates, territory, and food. We found that the reward pathway in the brain becomes engaged in response to an aggressive event and that dopamine is involved. We're designed to focus on violence. We're programmed to respond to it. Beyond more se a mere severe viral value, violence can trigger pleasure, increase sensory acuity. The writers of the study, um, Fascination Violence, say this, hunting for men, more rarely for women, I found this fascinating, is fascinating and emotionally arousing with the parallel release of testosterone, serotonin, and endorphins, which can produce feelings of euphoria and alleviate pain. Big game hunting, as well as the attack of other communities, is more successful in groups. Men also perceive it as more pleasurable. This may explain the fascination with gladiatorial combat, violent video games, but as well with ritualized forms like football. I don't think you could see this. This is a chart that shows from arousal to readiness, display, menace, attack, ritual, fight, violence, and kill, and the release of the chemicals at each stage. What they're finding now is that you don't actually have to go through violent content to have these chemicals released. You just have to watch it. When you watch it, the same chemicals are now being released. If you've ever been to an event of this sort, you watch the reactions of pure pleasure at the violence in the faces of the observers, and you can see there's a biochemical trigger that's going on there. There's also psychological reasons. I find this really interesting, too. What we observe in nature is the role of dominance. The alpha male gets to procreate. The weak gets the scraps. In the pack, you align yourself for the strong if you're not strong yourself, and so gladiators begin to function for us as surrogates. We align ourselves with the strong, and thus we feel strong ourselves. Again, watching the reaction of the crowd when their fighter wins, uh, I watched lots of clips of like these parties where they show the fights, and at the knockout, you just watch the people when somebody gets knocked out. It's, it's, it's like the greatest thing ever. They're jumping, high-fiving, slamming. There's videos, you know, they're waving their private parts around. They're coming up to the camera going, F you, Philly, F you, Philly. And it's as if it's their victory. They're separated by thousands of miles and a television screen. But it's as if they just did it themselves. There's clearly a biochemical and psychological. I, think it, I really think, when I think about this a lot, um, I think it goes deeply into identity issues, especially for men. We want to feel strong, and somehow we want to align ourselves with the strong. Um, we want to share the victory. Um, so here's, that's why, why we're aroused by it. But I want to take you through the science that I've discovered happens to the people who participate in it. I don't think anybody would argue that MMA is not violent, um, but you may not know the level. The estimated injury incident in MMA is greater than all other full combat uh, sports. 28.6 injuries per 100 fight participants. That's twice as much as boxing. There have been, in sanctioned MMA events, seven known deaths since 2007 due to head trauma. 
The, the, the most commonly injured body region is the head. That's about 70% of reported injuries. The incidence of match-ending head trauma is 31.9%. Here's, here's what's interesting. A retrospective review of 844 UFC fights from 2006 to 12 found that head trauma was the immediate cause of every knockout that occurred. In the 30-second interval, uh, b immediately preceding match stoppage, so the last 30 seconds before there's a stoppage, here's what they found. They've, they've timed this. The losers sustain, on average, 18.5 strikes, 92% going to the head. And if you notice this in the fights, the average time between the K K KO strike when they're knocked out and they fall to the floor and when the, 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 the referee shucks the guy, it's about four seconds and they get three more shots in on the head. So the guy is clearly out and then on the ground and they give three more direct head shots. There's no denying these fighters will have a problem in the future. Sorry, one quote earlier. We clearly identified a pattern of competitors continuing to strike the defenseless opponents after a suspected loss of consciousness and or falling to the ground. The fighters also sustained additional secondary head trauma when they fell to the ground. Quote, Chris Nowinski says, there is no denying these fighters will have problems in the future because they're exposed to extraordinary amounts of brain trauma. You're striking each other in the head. The reality of mixed martial arts is you're able to throw kicks and knees to the head, which exposes the fighters to even greater brain trauma. So here's what happens when you have a concussive event. I think I skipped part of this, but I'll, I think we, yeah. Um, when you have a concussive event, these are the things that happen. There's a destructive pathological and biochemical response. Repeated head trauma such as this can result in what's known as a CTE, chronic traumatic um, encephalopathy. I'll try to say that three times fast. CTE is progressive degenerative disease found in people who have had a severe blow or repeated blows to the head. So its clinical uh, manifestations of CTE can include motor deficits, affective and personality changes, including a decline in impulse control, Impaired cognitive function in regard to the latter, new physiological studies of former boxers indicate difficulties with memory, processing speed, complex attentional tasks, sequencing abilities, and frontal execution limitations. Here's a chart of the kinds of symptoms that they find in people that had CTE. And the reason I say CTE can only be diagnosed after you're dead. So you can have it but you can only diagnose it post-mortem. There is no, to date, the only definitive means of diagnosing it is post-mortem. The treatment of it is only theoretical and remains to be validated. And uh, there are no known preventive interventions for CTE. So we know it's happening. We know that these guys are getting massive brain traumas. Um, they can't really find out until afterwards how bad it is, but they can. They're starting to, to measure the size of the brain, and they find that after six years of fighting, the brain begins to shrink. What's more disturbing, sorry, uh, our study shows there appears to be a threshold at which continued repetitive blows to the brain begins to cause measurable changes in memory, thinking, despite brain volume changes that can be found earlier. We, f we watch just the fights. What we don't see is the hundreds of hours of sparring and training you think about the number of shots that these guys are taking to the head. Um, uh, let me just, yeah. Here's a real life example. This is Gary Goodrich. He fought more than 80 bouts between kickboxing and MMA in 14 years. He suffered 14 TKOs. He lost his, eight, his last eight MMA bouts. An article writes this, ask his friends and they'll tell you the changes to Gary Goodrich's personality happened the same way the brain damage did gradually over the course of several years. His speech got a little harder to understand. He didn't tell as many jokes. He forgot things. He'd forget appointments, forget whole conversations. He'd call a friend on the phone, talk to them for a while, then hang up and call them back 10 minutes later. These days, he spends most of his time in bed. He watches a lot of TV, probably 10 hours a day, and he's more or less glued to his iPhone, which he uses as a sort of exterior memory bank. So question three. Do we as Christians have reason to rethink our own consumption of events such as these when people take such punishment for our personal entertainment? We're going to return to Jesus' Sermon on the Mount here for just a second. This is Matthew 5, 43. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. 
He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Now, you and I are all familiar with this teaching, but perhaps we've never thought, thought through exactly the principle that Jesus is founding his teaching upon. Here's what's true. true. Human beings are inherently tribal. We like to separate the world into us's and them's. Us's are our people, the people we like, the people we trust, the people in proximity. It's friends, it's family, it's associates, they're our tribe. Then there are the them's. These are those outside the tribe. They may be those who irritate us or oppose us or threaten us, but sometimes it's just simply those who are different than us. These people become the other. They're outside of our tribe. Out on the margins, we begin to stop seeing their humanity, and thus we begin to justify treating them as less than human. This is what the Germans did to the Jews, and what the Bosnians did to the Serbs, and the Hutus did to the Tutsis. No one needs to teach us to love our tribe and hate our enemy. It's inherent. Here's what Jesus says. You know what I want you to do? I want you to love the thems. I want you to love the thems in the same way you love the us's. I want you to bless them and pray for them and greet them and care for them. Why? Because God the Father causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends his reign on the righteous and the unrighteous. What does this point to? God is the Father of all. This is, the ref uh, this is a reference to the fact that all human beings are made in the image of God and called into being by Him. To say that the sun shines and the rain falls is to recognize our common human experience. All people have hopes and dreams, joys and sorrows, values and goals, all want to have meaningful lives and want their families to flourish. When humans forget this, the other becomes an obstacle or an uh, object either an object to be used or an obstacle to be overcome. And here's my contention. These MMA fighters cease to be people when they enter the ring. They become for us objects to be used for entertainment. Jamie Levine, the only UFC champion to ever retire undefeated with 30 consecutive wins, says this. You don't go to a rodeo to watch a guy stay in a bull for eight seconds. You want to see the guy thrown off and stomped. I think people like the realness of someone being hurt. People want to watch something real, something they can smell and feel, but they don't care about me. Chico Evans, Al Chico Evans says this, there could be someone lifeless on the ground and the crowd is just there yelling and laughing. Even from a, this is, I got this off a pro MMA website called MMA Mania. Even there, there's concern over the inability to connect real injury with the person being injured. Quote, for some reason, the mixed martial arts community seldom thinks twice when we see a fighter lose consciousness because of the concussive force generated by a knee to the forehead. Instead of being concerned for the concussed fighter's well-being, our usual reaction is to laud his opponent's skill at inducing head trauma. If we can recognize that real and lasting damage is being done to the participants, we need to ask if our vicarious thrill should ever be done at the expense of another human being. Think of the head trauma. It's my contention that the brain, follow me with this for just a second, I know it's late. The brain is the organ that conveys the soul. Damage the organ and the soul cannot be fully expressed. Gary Goodridge is your example. He cannot be any longer fully human in the way he was designed to be. He cannot fulfill the destiny that God had for him when the brain that conveys the soul is damaged. Can I enjoy myself if I know that in 10 years' time, one of the fighters in the octagon may not be able to complete sentences or remember his kid's name? I contend that MMA as a spectator sport is just another form of pornography. I'm going to show, I want you to hear me, but I want to just keep this in mind. When I objectify another, I use them for pleasure. And when, I finished, when I'm finished, I throw them away. I never see that the person has a name, a family, a story, hopes and dreams, goals and values. Jesus instructs us that the enemy shares our human experience. They are made in God's image. 
and we thus can no longer justify treating them as just an object or as less than human. The humanity of the fighters, both of whom have been called into being by God, both of whom are made in God's image, both of whom have lives outside the ring, should be considered before I begin to enjoy the abuse inflicted on their bodies within the octagon. I could also argue that these events feed vice, not virtue. They don't teach us to love or care. They do not connect us to beauty, goodness, mercy, or compassion. They trigger aggression, hostility, objectification, and dehumanization. Just watch what happens to you when you are exposed to it. And finally, I would argue that these events glorify violence, not peacemaking. We are celebrating what we say we want to pass away. If we're called to be peacemakers, we need to celebrate that which leads to peace and not that which perpetuates violence. I'll have the lights come up. I'll make one other quick point in this section before I draw some conclusions. <clears throat> the discussion folds in other sports like boxing, perhaps football, but it also folds in real life videos that we find on websites like um, World Star Hip Hop, which compiles for us every month something called Fight, uh, Fight Club, Fight Comp. It's 25 minutes of the best street fights that people videotape. It's also on YouTube. I'd also say perhaps we need to reconsider those fail videos with the laugh tracks when you see people fall off their bikes and go into trees. <laughs> it's the same basic process. If we see the people not as objects but as people, we may again, in the spirit of Jesus, simply lose our taste for seeing violence that's being done to them. Okay, let's draw some conclusions. <clears throat> I want to conclude with where we began. My beginning assumption was that we want to be disciples of Jesus, so let's work on that a bit more. One of my favorite exercises in my church planning or my Christian perspective class is to explore what it means to be Jesus' disciples. Discipleship in the day of Jesus was akin to apprenticeship in our day. I do this uh, with my classes, but I say, let's say tomorrow morning you woke up and said, I want to be a guitar maker for the rest of my life. How would you do it? Well, you'd go learn on YouTube, right? No, you would go and you'd find a master. You would find somebody who has the skill, who's dedicated their life to it, right? And you would go and you would ask them to instruct you. You would apprentice yourself to them. And you would, as an apprentice, watch, you'd ask questions, you'd begin to develop skills under the watchful eye of the master until such time as you could competently produce similar results as the master did. So if we think about Jesus that way, that Jesus was a master and he chose 12, but there were literally hundreds of people that approached him and said, can I be your disciple? Ask this question, what was it that Jesus was a master of? What was he good at? What did he know that only he could teach such that people would drop everything, even their families and businesses, to go follow him? In this exercise, we conclude that Jesus was really good at these things. He was good at living with his Father in the kingdom of God in a way that produced what can only be called a flourishing life. Everything in the Sermon on the Mount, when you think of all the range of issues he speaks to, they had to be lived before it was taught in order for Jesus to have authority. At the end of the Sermon on the Mount, the people say they were amazed because he had authority, not as the teachers of the law. Now think back to all the rest of those issues. For him to have authority, it means this. It means that people never sensed that Jesus was judging them and dismissing them. It means they never saw Jesus worry. It means that Jesus knew how to love his enemies. It means that Jesus was not invested in earthly treasures. It means that every woman in the crowd felt safe in his gaze and never felt treated. You know how guys do, right? Look up and down, quickly quantify, do I, does this person deserve me staring at them more or do I move on? No woman ever felt used in that way by Jesus. For these reasons, Jesus was incredibly attractive to those around him. But the life Jesus expressed by the Sermon on the Mount also led him to the cross, and it's through the cross, not the Sermon on the Mount, where we can experience the kind of life that makes the Sermon on the Mount possible. Don't start at the Sermon on the Mount. You have to start at the cross. From Jesus' death, we receive the free gift of forgiveness, reconciliation, life. We're then filled with the Spirit who makes possible that which was impossible for us before. Because of the Spirit of God living in us, we can now live with God as our Father in the kingdom of God 
and produce a flourishing life that resembles Jesus' own life. Recall with me what you experienced when you first met Jesus for the first time and received this gift. I can't speak for you, but I can tell you that meeting Jesus brought me incredible peace. The restlessness, the aloneness, the hopelessness I'd felt before was resolved. Jesus also rooted me in an identity. For the first time, I felt I knew who I was, that I was known and loved and called as a child of God. He brought deep healing into my life. He spoke to my insecurities and fears and brokenness and brought me into places of healing and health. He changed the trajectory of my life, injecting it with meaning and purpose. He gave me a path to follow that began to form me into a spiritually mature person. And now, 28 years later, after placing my confidence in Jesus, I still find him incredibly attractive. I want to learn from him how to live my life, and I want, to, I want my life to increasingly reflect his. If that's your desire, then, hear Jesus' call to us in a fresh way. Jesus said to his disciples, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. He says, You are my friends if you do what I command. He says, The student is not above the teacher nor a servant above his master. It's enough for students to be like their teachers and servants like their masters. Jesus calls us to learn from him how to live our lives. That means abandoning. I want you to hear this. That means abandoning all other masters and all other teachers that conflict with him. It also means practicing what he taught until these things become second nature to us. So where should we begin? Well, now the Sermon on the Mount is as good a place to start as any. Try to find any key issue in there of life that's not addressed. Anger, lust, greed, worry, judging. Jesus is ready to teach us as the master of life how to live as he lived. And if we can embody all, <clears throat> if we can embody and live out the kinds of things that Jesus did, I believe we will become incredibly attractive to our world in the same way he was to his. In other words, we may be able to speak back to our culture with authority because they've seen the truth of our words first demonstrated in the lives we actually live. Let's connect this all to our topic today. What might Jesus say to us out of his Sermon on the Mount about our participating in our violence drunk culture? He speaks to us in three distinct ways. First, we're called to live not out of the myth of redemptive violence, but out of Jesus' narrative of redemptive peace. Jesus was the ultimate peacemaker, and he calls us to the same work. In Matthew 5, 9, he says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they'll be called children of God. Dietrich Bonhoeffer says the followers of Jesus have been called to peace. When he called them, they found their peace, for he is their peace. But now they are told they must not only have peace, but they have to make it. And to that end, they renounce all violence and tumult in the cause of Christ. Nothing is to be gained by such methods. We've been called out of violence uh, in this world. Colossians 1.13, he's delivered us <clears throat> from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we love and have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Now, Richard Hayes tells us, we are to exemplify the reality of the kingdom of God in a pluralistic and sinful world. We are thus to renounce the violence of this world and instead organize our lives around the practice of shalom. Walter Brueggemann says, shalom is an announcement that God has a vision for the way the world should be and is not yet. The twin resolve of the church is that we mean to discern God's vision of what the world should be and that we mean to live toward that vision. Will that be easy for us? Bonhoeffer says, Shalom is not only an incredible gift, it is its most demanding mission. But James, the brother, the little brother of Jesus, I like to think, says this, peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. I like that. With this before us, we examine then all that is presented to us in movies and television and ask, does the movies and television I watch position me to believe in <clears throat> yearn for, that's supposed to say yearn, yearn for, or to work for peace, does it cause me to reaffirm the myth of redemptive violence? Second, we've seen Jesus in his Sermon on the Mount reveal that we allow what, <clears throat> what we allow our minds to dwell on can form in us powerful internal habits and dispositions. 
Our fantasy lives can either be based on what I would do if I could get away with it, or we can allow ourselves to dwell on those things that characterize life in the kingdom of God. Should we fantasize about doing things that God forbids? Should we put before our minds images that feed vice, aggression, hostility, or that diminish compassion or empathy? Or do we learn from Jesus how to reorient the heart towards the right sorts of things? Goodness, truth, compassion, virtue, and love. We may all agree that we have an appetite for <coughs> violence as entertainment, but isn't the point of our faith our need to submit our appetites and desires to God's kingdom? Is it not to unlearn one way of living and learn a whole new way of entering the world? As it says in Ephesians, you were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Brueggemann says we're expected to become what we are not. Thus, when it comes to the violence that is inherent to many of our video games, we learn to take care with what we allow to ourselves to dwell on, fantasize about, and hunger for. Finally, we have seen Jesus reassert the vital importance of the Imago Dei, the image of God. To recognize that all human beings are made in the image of God is to challenge the way the world works. The world teaches us to separate, to label, to quantify people as either valuable to us or worthless. If valuable, it's usually only in a utilitarian way, used for what they can do for us. And in this process, we typically strip people of their humanity so they largely become objects to us. Ray Anderson says, sin is the inversion of the Imago Dei. In fact, he says, sin is the history of the distortion and dismissal of the Imago Dei. Jesus calls us to see the Imago Dei in all people and to see that God calls all people into being and have inherent dignity and thus they should matter to us. There are no throwaways in God's kingdom nor are people ever to be treated as objects. The Imago Dei is a gift or an endowment which takes place in the concrete particular existence in each person. Taking this seriously, I cannot cheer, laugh, chuckle, or exult when violence occurs to another human being, nor can I allow myself to be entertained by it. Because God wills that I also love what he loves, my fellow human beings, I have an ethical obligation to support the life of each person whom God loves. This makes us take a serious look at the sports that have violence inherent to it, asking questions like this. Is my enjoyment coming at another's suffering? Do I need to care what ultimately happens to the person in the arena? Should I consider what it means for the rest of their life? What happens if I take these things seriously? Well, here the church in the first four centuries becomes a model for us. Glenn Stassen writes this. Christians in the first few centuries saw the Sermon on the Mount as the central statement of the Christian faith and life. No scripture was more quoted and referenced by Christian theologians than the period before the Nicene Council in the fourth century. And because they took that ethic so seriously, they began to live in ways that clearly were counter to the culture. Hang with me for just a second. We're almost done. The early church saw the Imago Dei, and so they cared for the stranger. They picked up the infants that were abandoned and brought them into their homes. They treated the sick. They welcomed the marginalized. It was the love of people that became the hallmark of the early church. Connected to our subject tonight, their conviction of the Imago Dei led them to abandon the gladiatorial contests that were so prevalent. The lone voice of protest against the carnage of the Roman games came from Christians. Believers stayed away from the amphitheaters, a practice promoted by church leaders such as Tertullian. The sheer brutality to both humans and animals was the primary reason Christians opposed the game. The blatant disregard for suffering and life itself promoted by Rome as sport, especially involving gladiators, ran counter to the teaching of Jesus and the early church. Eventually, pressure from Christians brought about the end of the gladiatorial games. Philip Schaff says this, There is scarcely any other single reform so important as the suppression of the gladiatorial shows, the credit for which should be given entirely to the Christian church. So now it comes to us. I contend that we need to distinguish ourselves from our culture when it comes to what we allow ourselves to be entertained by. We need to rethink the nature of the violence that surrounds us. We must consider how it affects us, and we should hold it up to the light of the gospel. 
If we do these things, we will, um, you ask, will we change the world as the early church changed theirs? And I will say this, I will not predict, nor do I care all that much. Our desire to adjust our choices should become because those choices are right and true and good and they're valuable in their own right. We don't do it to change the world, we do it to change ourselves. But I believe that large change starts with small actions and faithfulness in the little things can have great impact. We're called to simple acts of faith that honor and represent Jesus well. So where do we start? As I said, no bonfires tonight. I really only want thoughtful engagement. I want you to ask good questions. I want you to start honestly assessing in your own right, your own life. I want you to begin to make change as God brings conviction. I believe in progress, not perfection. Grace, grace, grace. My family is on a journey, as my son Sam would tell you. We're in constant conversation about hip hop and violent ga video games and lots of stuff. Let's learn together how to do this well and do it right. I'll leave you with Paul's words to the Church of Colossae paraphrased by Eugene Peterson. Let every detail in your lives, words, actions, whatever, be done in the name of the Master Jesus, thanking God the Father every step of the way. I do really thank you for your attention. I'm going to invite Kevin Adams up now. He's going to lead us just in the last few minutes of our time together. turned you down. For your microphone skills. <laughs> Can you hear me now? Can you guys hear me now? You're on. What did we do? We broke something. There we go. It would be too corny to say he did violence to the microphone, uh. wouldn't it? No, Brad, let me be the first to say how grateful we are for that thoughtful, uh, wise, graceful, um, presentation that steered clear of legalism and easy answers and condemnation of culture but was very constructive and helpful and wise and we will take uh, the fruit of this with us not only today but for a long long time um, my, my name is Kevin Adams like Brad said I'm a pastor just up the road at Grant Springs Church I'm also a adjunct professor here at uh, William Jessup and for purposes for tonight one of the joys of my life is that I get to be friends with this guy. We have met with a couple other pastors, including Father Chris Flasaurus, that some of you know, for about 12, 14, 15 years. We oh, lose counts 15, on uh, Thursdays. So um, anyway, for tonight, uh, we're going to do some Q&A, about 10, 12 minutes worth. And Brad asked me to have the first question. So my question as a pastor and professor goes like this. It's a bit of a, a pastoral scenario. A young woman in your Christian Perspective class has just been hired to be youth pastor at a local church. She's asked the students, of all the things you could do at our first overnight, what would you like to do? And the guys especially are lobbying for call of duty. They say, this will bring in our cool guy friends. If you want to be cool with us, if you want the youth group to grow, we want to do this. She's, she's leaving in five minutes. You've got a class in five minutes, so you have to give a five minute pastoral answer. What are, what are some of the first things that come to mind? What should she be thinking about? Well, it just so happens my youth pastor is here tonight, Kyle Branderhorst, <laughs> and maybe Kyle would like to take that now. <laughs> uh, again, I refer back to this um, interview with Kevin Scott of Games and Gods. He, sa he, he teaches 18, 19, 20-year-olds. <clears throat> And he says, you know, Brad, what I find is sometimes uh, I just try to ask the hard questions, but I, I may not see fruit of those hard questions for 10 years. Um, I will tell you this, um, turn the other cheek is very important to me, um, but I've made it clear that I want my sons to own that for themselves, and I don't want to put them on them until they can really articulate what that actually means. So you get to grow in some of these convictions. I'm a 50-year-old man. Uh, I watched all this stuff for 50 years, right? Um, it came to my attention as a part of this process 
just two, three years ago, and now it's a, a concern of mine. So I'm not sure I can expect my youth to process at a deep level. I think asking good questions, uh, I think even being interactive, my kids hate watching movies with me because because we, I, I get them to look at the content and the messages and the stories. I wonder if a youth pastor should just be in a provocateur kind of role in that regard. Okay, that's helpful. Thanks, thanks, Brad. Maybe uh, three, four questions from the group. I'll run over to where you are with a microphone if you raise your hand. Yeah. And I just have the question, why would God give us such a sensation or a sensibility to to that violence the david and goliath the the samson all these tales of of kind of aggression overcoming evil you know deborah with a spike and a tent spike why would that be imbued in our spirit and and yet and, and we're drawn to it and, and yet so we want to overcome it uh i'd be careful not to validate all the violence in the old testament as god sanctioned personally. I'd be careful with that as an assumption. Um, I would also say that uh, uh, I think these things are necessary for us to live in the world. Uh, the, the biochemical responses are, are obviously built in, but what I find it to be when it's combined with our brokenness is when we have real problems, right? So this is what we're trying to do. We're trying to step back from it, see it within the context of our brokenness to say, what can I own of what it means to be a man or a person in this world? under the grace that I get as a disciple of Jesus and stepping back into it. So I don't want to deny what it means to be a human person or even a man. I don't want to deny the processes that are in me. I just want them to be redeemed. I want them to be a part of the kingdom of God. That's, that's, that's what I would say. Thanks. Uh, yeah. Professor Swope, I was just wondering, um, looking at the information you had at the beginning of the presentation regarding the amount of Christians that are actually, mm. you know, taking in uh, violent uh, media as well as television shows, movies, whatever it may be, with that, I know we have channels, you know, I'm going to throw the stereotypical one out, Hallmark, that offers, you know, our generic Christian type mm. movies that Christian Hollywood's making, do you think the Christian response in movie making and television and all that is kind of failing and being able to answer, you know, what we're seeing with Christians going towards more violent content? Yeah, I, I don't have a good answer for you because I don't watch Christian movies, television, or listen to Christian music by and large. I don't, I, I don't find it to be usually addressing life at the level which I find it. I tend to find that they try to address the problems and solve them all, and that's not my life, and it's not the life of my church. So I don't, I don't typically find Christian entertainment to really be helpful in asking hard questions or teasing out the grays. So we're left with the culture that tells really good stories, but from a broken place to the, typically the church that tells really nice stories that cut, get tied up in a bow. And I don't, I don't have a good answer to say, that we need good artists. Um, I, I'm grateful for our creative arts program here that may be producing uh, good artists in the world that produce really wonderful things. One of my best friends is a guy named Tony Hale. He's Buster Bluth from Arrested Development. Uh, he was my roommate. Yeah, I know, it's fairly funny to think about. Uh, we have these conversations all the time. Uh, it's, so it's not easy. It's not easy to be a Christian in the arts, but I think we do need Christians in the arts to, to really tell good stories. Um, and that doesn't mean just all nicey-nice stories either, right? Now, one of my favorite bands is a band called Mute Math. Um, and they, they tell, they're really honest. They, they, they actually sing really honest songs. And I, I find them to be compelling. Um, they take me somewhere that's good, but they don't try to solve all my problems within the lyric. I, I don't know if I'm answering your question, except for I feel frustrated by the kind of entertainment that's offered to me as well. And again, I'm not asking for an out, outright rejection of any movie or television show that has violence in it, all right? I want us to assess it and ask the effect of it on us. Yeah. Yeah. Hi. Uh, first, I want to say I appreciated your talk. I really enjoyed it, actually. It caused me to think deeply. Um, made me think of, uh, do you think there's a time when violence is acceptable? Um, and or appropriate. It makes me think of the time when Jesus himself 
was upset and said, you know, this is a house, of, this, my house should be a house of prayer. And he, mm -hmm. he, he was quite violent, flipping over tables. Um, curious as to your thoughts. Yeah, I've been working on this for 20 years. I don't find myself to be comfortable in a pacifist position. I read uh, a lot of folks who do something called just peacemaking, which is kind of an aggressive <laughs> pacifism. And I, I find it somewhat compelling. I am not ready to tell my sons. I tell them when they go to school, if somebody puts their hands on you or you're allowed to defend yourself, right? So um, I, I find myself um, perplexed <laughs> as to how to live in the world. But I, if I keep on submitting to the teaching of Jesus, especially in the Sermon on the Mount, and I let it wash me and influence me, I know that it leads me away from violence, typically, right? It doesn't lead me toward, it leads me to figure out any possible way where violence isn't necessary. I'd love for us to be there, right? So I can't answer big questions about just war theory and, and right, these things are really, they take really thoughtful, prayerful people, but I know that Jesus leads me away from violence personally. I wanna call my church, my students to the same sorts of things, yeah. I'm quite happy if there are no more questions. <laughs> These are hard now, that's fine. <laughs> this is actually hard. Hello, <laughs> okay, I'll make this quick. Um, so this is coming from someone who practiced uh, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu Muay Thai for a very long time. And I was wondering, so do you think that the art itself is bad or do you think that maybe perhaps it's the way the UFC portrays it and the way that they advertise it? Yeah, I tell people all the time this. I'm quite happy for them to have their events. They should just not allow spectators. <laughs> if you want to test your skills in that art form, fine. Just don't, let's, let's not celebrate the violence that's done to you. Uh, and I say that kind of tongue-in-cheek a little bit. My niece, uh, what, what was the second one you say? Mai Tai? Mo yeah, Muay Thai. Muay Thai. <laughs> so she's practicing. Mai Tai is something else. Hold on. Everybody <laughs> Someone turn get him say, one afterwards. Turn to the camera and say, hi, Corinne. So she is, she's practicing for her first fight. So we've had some really interesting conversations about this. Uh, I'd be interested in her response to this. I may not be the right person because these are not my disciplines. Like, I think probably you're the right person to ask that question of, right? So I, w I would like to have your input as to what, what you would think because you're a Christian that's practicing these things. I don't think they're inherently bad or wrong. So you may be the person that teaches the church the value of those things, not me. Does that make sense? Okay, there was one over here I saw. Well, uh, I, call okay, it, yeah, call I'm, gonna call, I'm gonna call it. So hey, three things we're gonna do yet tonight. One is thank Brad one more time. So let's do that. <laughs> <laughs>